Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Add the Ask the Pastor podcast show. Featuring a lot of high tech gadgetry, special effects wizardry, state of the art lighting, and camera work. Um, all brought to you by your good friends at the craziest church in the world, Christ Church Ottawa. Affiliated with the Four Gospel Square, Four Square Gospel Church of Canada. An awesome crew of people. Look them up on the web, Four Square Church Canada. Find out what we're all about. And uh, actually, Christ Church is not even a, a typical Four Square Church. It's it's really different. Okay, and um, the only way you can kind of understand what's going on with us is to hang out with us and so every time we get together it's public everybody's invited and if you like it great if you don't well at least you gave it a shot didn't you and this this program is uh, one of the many outreaches of Christ Church in downtown Ottawa we're gonna pray Jesus thank you Lord God, that you give life to this thing we do every Tuesday night. And Lord, we get word back like crazy, Lord, of people that are ministered to. And you touch through it, God, and, and we're happy about that. That's great, God. Thank you for Kirk, Lord God, that provides us with uh, most of the questions. Thank you for the people, Lord God, that are getting bold enough when they're watching us live on Tuesday night, Scott, to to type in a comment or type in a question, Lord, because you know they take precedence, God. And um, when people can join us live, it's just, it's really exciting, God. And, and we pray that, Lord, uh, we'll be able to touch some people tonight that way. And people wouldn't be afraid. They'd be they'd bold enough to share, Lord God. Take this where we can't take it, Lord God. We're going to be faithful. We're going to do our best. But, Lord, we know that what we offer up to you tonight, Lord, is only five loaves and two fishes, and it's never going to cut it. And we wouldn't even be doing this, God, if we didn't know what happens when we put our five loaves and two fishes into the hands of the master. And it's in your hands now, God. So bring it alive. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready to go? So you got the ground rules, most of you. This is our 114th show, okay? Yeah, I would think after 114 shows, you kind of kind of got the gist of what we're doing now, okay? Kind of know the routine. Here comes the first question. In your personal view on eschatology, eschatology is the study of the end times, prophetic literature, okay? When the Bible makes predictions, okay? In your personal view on eschatology, as important as our view of the immaculate is, okay, is our personal view, okay? I guess Kirk kind of puts us together here, which is fair. Is our personal view on eschatology as important as our view on the Immaculate Conception? Or our view on how we are justified? Um, Kirk, without knowing it there, you might, you may know or may not know, but you're comparing historical fact uh, with uh, predictions that are shrouded in mystery intentionally. Okay? I mean, the reason why eschatology is not cut and dried, and the reason why it's so ridiculously open to interpre interpretation is because Jesus said it's not for you to know, okay? Don't sweat over this, okay? And uh, he said, you're going to be close enough to me that you're not going to be taken unawares. And um, he, he rebukes the disciples when they ask him when he's coming back, just before he goes to ascends up to heaven on the Mount of Olives. He says, it's not for you to know. But you will, you know, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses, and, you know, in Judea and, and around the world. And he says, stay in Jerusalem, wait there, and tarry, wait on me until you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
very clear in the way he said it that uh, this is way more important than um, you know you uh, uh, hanging around forever and and uh, trying to figure out when I'm coming back. Okay, You're, I'm going to come back, to, whether you got to figure it out or not. But here's what you need to concern yourself with, and he tells them what they need to get busy with. Okay, so. Uh, um, <sighs> You know, our view of uh, the Immaculate Conception, that Jesus was born of a virgin, okay, that, that uh, uh, um, Mary was uh, conceived perfectly by the Holy Spirit, that's a historical fact, okay? And uh, uh, how we are justified, that's laid out very clear in Scripture. You know, the just shall live by faith. It's something you accept. And... Um, you know, that's the main difference. Uh, uh, one is very plain doctrine that's 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 tried and true and, and completely understood. And uh, uh, the other is, uh, man, you uh, we're not really sure about it, okay? Uh, we knew going to know what's going to happen, but the details, man, uh, and, and people feel, if you, people aren't satisfied with enough with the amount of details that Jesus has given them. And, you know, they need to grow up and just trust God, okay? Um, and, and one of the reasons why they want more details is because knowledge puffs up. When you've got more information, you feel smarter. You know, it's a bit of an ego trip. Um, uh, and, and faith and justification, you know, there's a there's kind of a mysterious line there, too. You know, when are you justified? What is faith? And, and, and that always, I would suggest that that has to be a bit of a mystery, too, because, uh, you know, God wants us, to, he wants to keep us humble. He wants to keep us hungry. He wants to keep us chasing after him. I'm convinced that if some of us, you know, were more cocksure of our salvation, we'd probably get looser in our in our in our living. You know, we try to push the envelope more. And I think the humility, when you're relying on Jesus, you know, you're 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 walking a lot more soberly, a not a lot more seriously. You're thinking about the Bible. You're thinking about Jesus. You're following Him a little more, you know, like a, a, a humbly and and a little more cautiously and 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 uh, um, um, carefully. Then oh I'm saved no problem I you, you go and go wanton crazy on whatever you know impulses you know grab me at the time it's a good topic be good for dialogue but we don't have the luxury of dialogue yet on ask the pastor so I'm just gonna do the best with what uh, you give me Kirk and, and what you usually give me is usually really good okay next question how often should a congregation hear their pastor read the word and not just quote it. Reverence, uh, um, you know, that's a really, really good uh, 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 question, okay? How often should a pastor hear there? I mean, there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, that there's a certain amount you're supposed to be reading, but um, I think reverence for the Bible is a really, really good thing, a wonderful thing, and I think it, it, it's, it, it's often lacking in evangelical churches that tend to be more extemporaneous in the way they do things, or they seem to be a little bit more off the cuff and, and informal. So I think, uh, uh, um, you know, yeah, the reading of Scripture isn't there as much as it should be. However, there is a reason the reading of Scripture is not there, um, because too often when Scripture has been an integral part of reading, okay, in in uh, uh, um, the way people do church is it, it's devolved into a way where it just becomes so ritualistic. It, it, people do it by rote. People do it by, uh, you know, like it's same old, same old. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, like for a, a lot of uh, uh, traditional churches uh, in North America, they feature, you know, you got to stand, you got to sit, you got to stand, you got to sit, you know, and there's, there's things that the priest says back and forth and you repeat back to him. It's, it's same old, same old. And everybody knows the routine. Everybody's got memorized. It means nothing to anybody. Because it's devolved into a routine. And I think when it comes to gathering together, to worship, to fellowship, to hear teaching, those are all, the Bible says the book of Acts, those were all part of their gatherings there. So that's the stuff we know we need to be doing. There needs to be worship, there needs to be fellowship, there needs to be the teaching of the word. Anything else is, hey, whatever fits the culture. And that's the beauty of the gospel. It, it, it adapts incredibly it's incredibly adaptable to different cultures and to different uh, priorities, okay? It's it's that powerful. And um, um, as long as it doesn't devolve into boredom. Um, I've said for years, and I've taken it on the chin, 
And I've had to explain it often to people, and I don't mind explaining it at all. It's a sin to bore people. For people who lead churches, it is a, you need to get it through your head. If you're boring people, you are sinning. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't say that explicitly, but I'll tell you what it does say. And I'll tell you some facts. Most people, the whopping percentage of Christians in North America, and the majority of the audience I'm speaking to right now is a North American audience, okay? The majority, it's probably the same in West, in, uh, in Europe and Asia as well, okay? But the majority, oh, it's about 50%, 60% of all the people who leave the church of their birth, they, you know, they leave the church of their faith, okay? 50 to 60% leave the church between the ages of 12 and 16, okay? So most people leave churches between the ages of 12 and 16. And you want to know what the number one reason is for those kids leaving church? boredom. They're bored silly. Okay? Now, Matthew 18 and 6, Jesus says, if you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it'd be better if you had a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea. Okay? I would suggest that boring kids, that they don't want to come to Jesus, I would suggest very strongly, you can't prove to me that that's not causing them to sin. Okay? That is opening up the door to them walking away from God. That is causing them to sin. Let me put it a little bit more explicitly. Jesus is basically saying, you cause these kids to sin, if you get, if you bore them in church, I'll kill you. That's where his priorities are when it comes to children, when it comes to, and, and I, it doesn't mean you have to hype the daylights out of the place, but boy, you better have something alive, okay? When you're getting together, you know, to, to talk about the greatest message to ever hit the planet, when you're getting together to talk about a message that young people worldwide gladly lay down their lives for, they lose jobs because of it, okay? Their families get torn up. In certain countries, you're going to jail, even if you possess a Bible, and they don't care. They don't go around bringing on, flashing their Bible all over the place, but boy, they're very, very careful. And they live that life because they know that life is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to them. If you take that wonderful life, of, the, of, of following Jesus Christ, and you water it down, or you ritualize it, or you let it devolve into some kind of rote, boring thing, boy, you are treading on dangerous ground, according to Jesus, okay? And I'm a pastor who feels that like you wouldn't believe. I know I can't pull rabbits out of a hat. I know I can't compete with the world's entertainment. Fortunately, I don't have to. I've got something the world can't give, the world can't take it away, okay? That's the, that's the, that's the dunamis where we get the word dynamite from the Greek word dunamis, that's, that's the dunamis, that's what the, 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 the word for power, the power of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is supercharging your church, it's dynamite. It's dynamite, and you know the difference. Okay? Good question, Kirk. All about reading Scripture. Nothing wrong with reading Scripture, just don't let it devolve into just same old, same old. And that can happen with anything. That can happen with your music. That can happen with your preaching. That can happen with, you know, the way you, you know, do fellowship. Most churches, not most, too many churches. I don't know. I haven't been in a lot of churches, but I mean, from my experience, limited experience, okay? Fellowship time. Turn around and shake hands with people. That's not fellowship time. That's some ritualistic, silly little ditty thing. I mean, come on. And it happens for two minutes. And then we got to get everybody's attention because the real star of that show is the preacher. And he's going to preach. He's going to perform. You ain't got time for your stupid little handshaking fellowship there. Come on, man. The superstar is going to give his message now. Oh, my goodness. No wonder people stay away from our churches. I recently watched a well-known Christian apologist, Dr. William Craig. Woohoo! Say the Bible was not the spirit-inspired word of God. Should that man walk away from his chosen profession and do something else? <clears throat> he can do whatever he wants, as far as I'm concerned. I won't be paying attention to him. If you're quoting him accurately, he actually said that. I can go jump off a cliff for all I care. He can go yeah, drive down, you know, Broadway in a limousine. I don't care. I got whatever he does. I'm not going to know because I don't pay attention to jerks like that. If what you're saying is true, I find it difficult that somebody who's got a reputation as a well-known Christian apologist, if he's a well-known Christian apologist, he wouldn't talk like that. So somebody's priorities are misplaced or somebody's misquoting something, something, somewhere. I don't care what it is. 
Does a Christian apologist, whew, such a lofty title, eh? Does a Christian apologist need to know false religions? I guess I should uh, 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 let you the, the, the rest of you in on what that terminology is. A Christian apologist, that is somebody that is uh, defending the gospel, somebody that uh, knows the gospel and, and defends it, you know, intellectually and philosophically and historically and every other way. He's a scholar, basically, okay? Does a Christian apologist need to know false religions as well as he knows the Bible? I heard one apologist say he only needed to know the truth. What do you say? Um, well, Paul, in the Bible, he said, study to show yourself approved. And uh, uh, what does that mean? Well, you know, when you talk, you know, people have reason to say, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, you, you, got, you can't just get up there and rant and rave and, you know, give us your experience of what God did for you. Well, that's going to be good, you know, if you're talking to different people all the time. But if you're pastoring a church and you're trying to disciple people, you got to teach them the truth. If you got to teach them the gospel, you're going to have to have a grip on, on what you're talking about, okay? He says, stay to show yourself approved. And that's the people that are listening. They got to, yeah, this guy's legit, you know? That's what it means. Um, does the average Christian need to know anything beyond the truth? Uh, do we need to know what we don't believe in? You know, there's a balance there. The, the scripture says, in all you're getting, get understanding. Okay, so it's a good thing to pursue knowledge. In all you're getting, get understanding. But it's also a balance. Because 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I can fathom all mysteries and don't have love, I'm useless. I'm annoying. Okay, so there's a balance there. Some people are called to be scholars. Um, you know, the uh, most of the church fathers that have molded uh, uh, the Christian thought in the last 2,000 years since the death of uh, and resurrection of Christ, most of them have had, you know, minimum uh, 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 master's uh, level degree in education. Okay? Martin Luther, George Whitfield, John Whitcliffe, uh, uh, um, Thomas Aquinas, uh, uh, um, John Huss, John Wesley. Charles Wesley, Charles Finney, these are all church fathers, every one of them, you know, very, very, very well-educated men. Guys like Smith Wigglesworth, they only had a grade four or five education. They're, they're, the, they're the exception. They're not the norm, okay? But God, you know, you also look at uh, 1 Corinthians 1 where it says God, who, who God chooses. And Paul said, I didn't come to you with the uh, cleverness of speech or the eloquence of man so that your faith would not rest on human reasoning. But on the Spirit's power, a lot of that is lacking in the evangelical world. I would say there's a lot greater need for the for the anointing and the empowering of the literal power of the Holy Spirit than, you know, like uh, intellectual, philosophical, apologetic, apologetic, apologetical, you know, doctrine. I thought I'd throw out some, you know, lofty words there. How should we disciple a new believer? He's the best. I'm going to give you the best recipe for discipleship you've ever heard. And everybody's an expert on it. They've written books on it. They can tell you more about discipleship than Jesus can, okay? And it, you know, the gospel's simple. You know, Jesus talked to most of the guys, most of the guys that were his followers, okay, when, when he was, uh, uh, when he led his disciples, most of the disciples weren't even educated. They couldn't even read. Now, they had a reason to after because they were spreading the gospel. Most of them got educated after, okay? So he was pretty simple, you know, because human nature doesn't need to be complicated. So how do you make disciples? Here's the best definition I've ever heard. Do the will of God and let other people watch closely. Bring them with you. Get him in on it. Do the will of God. Let other people watch. Like Thursday night, we feed the poor. We sit and visit with people. We laugh with people. We invite people to join us all the time. Why? Because we're trying to disciple people. We're doing the will of God. We know we need to be loving the poor. We know we need to be meeting their needs as best we can. We know we need to be praying for them. We know we need to be working our way into their life, okay? And people hang out with us, and you want to know something? We do the will of God. Other people watch it. They realize, oh, I could do that. Before you know it, they're getting a heart for people. They're praying for them. They're getting to their, they're reading their Bible more because they want to know more about the Jesus that changes people's lives. Do the will of God. Let other people watch. You know, if you got to go, if you want to go pray somewhere, take somebody with you. You want to study the Bible. Do somebody with you. Have somebody do it with you. If you're involved in your church and music and whatever, have somebody watch. That's all Jesus did. Jesus warmed the countryside for three years. He did the will of God. These all these guys, these guys watched every once in a while. He said, "Now you do it." Huh? What? I, I don't do it. You can do it. Go. And they did it. Simple. Do the will of God. Let somebody else watch. 
The word mystery in the New Testament means what exactly? Same thing it does in our language. It's pretty simple. Uh, you know, if if uh, if mystery wasn't mysterious, it wouldn't be a mystery. So, you know, it would be called something else. It's, it's no difference. No use trying to add or take away. It is what it is. I believe it was Paul that wrote there was a hardening of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles came to a belief in Christ. Okay, does this mean sharing the gospel with Jews is pointless for the time being? No, not uh, that's that's not a teaching that's that's biblical. Okay, I, I, that's not. Uh, it says in the Bible that Jerusalem, I think what you're confusing with the scripture, and I can't remember, Zechariah or one of the Old Testament things, the, 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 the Jerusalem will be trodden over until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And just about every biblical and historical scholar, that doesn't mean they're right because it's not an explicit thing, but um, it, it speak about the city of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has been under Gentile control for 2,000 years since the resurrection of Christ and since before, up until 1967. During the Six Day War, you know, like uh, uh, Arab forces and 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 uh, uh, you know, the terrorist forces attacked Israel. Well, they fought back and they took back territory that they hadn't had uh, 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 reign over for over two thousand years. They took over the West Bank and the West Side of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is no longer overtrodden by the Gentiles. Okay, it is run by Jews, and it's for the first time in two thousand years. It's a significant, significant thing. Okay, I mean that's. To me, that's the, the 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 interpretation of that scripture that seems to make the most sense to me. Okay, it has nothing to do with sharing the gospel and the hardening of your heart. You know, I I'd like to see the biblical reference for that. I've never heard of that in scripture. What do B.C. and A.D. stand for? B.C. B, before Christ, and uh, uh, A.D. after death. Uh, the the Greek word for uh, the the Latin is anno domini. Same thing. Okay. After the death of Christ, before Christ, after Christ. And, you know, now they're saying BCE, before common era, and then CE, common era, which is such a load of bull crap. I mean, they're in total denial that Jesus Christ is the center of time. Jesus Christ had such an impact on the world that they even changed the dates because of him. Okay. Secular is trying to rob God of his glory. God doesn't care. He's not insecure. It's just so, it's just so, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, immature. It's just so like, so comically uh, 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 cheesy and, and low rate. I mean, come on, you know, common era before common era. Boy, yeah, you may as well say, well, let's do everything we can to try and make people think that Jesus never existed and he hasn't had the impact on history that he has. Yeah, well, good luck with that, Sherlock. And, you know, the sad thing is that people are so lost spiritually that they're buying it, you know? People have turned their back on God and, and they have they have uh, uh, followed uh, uh, doctrines taught by demons. In fact, I want to look up that scripture. I used that scripture in my sermon on Sunday, and I refer to it a lot. And, and, you know, you need to get the reference for it here. Where is it here? It's 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. And, and even people who don't have faith, you know, they're looking at the news and, and the things that are happening and the priorities people have and the passions people have, and they are shaking their heads. They can't believe it. They can't believe the world's gone so crazy. Okay? Here's the reason why. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. But the Spirit explicitly says, that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to, to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, okay? You got people whose conscience has been so seared, they don't have a conscience anymore. So they're promoting doctrines taught by demons. Now, a lot of core of the doctrines being taught by demons is coming from some of the wealthiest people in the world. Well, that shouldn't surprise you. Because the Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You know? The Bible says, Jesus said, you cannot love God and love money. You're either going to hate one or love the other. Okay? Hey, you're going to argue with Jesus? I'm not going to. There's all signs of Christians that want to argue them. 
There's all sorts of Christians that go around teaching, oh, yeah, you could be wealthy. In fact, if you're not wealthy, you're not very godly. I mean, that's, that's flipping heresy. Okay, that is that is totally wrong doctrine. That gospel would get you kicked out of the church in the first century because Paul said to the church in Galatians, Galatians 1, 6, and 9, if you receive a different gospel than what you know you receive from us, you're going to be cursed. Cast that person out. Well, that's a different gospel. It's diametrically opposed to the words of Jesus. And you got these TV preachers living in mansions preaching that, that absolute demonic filth. Let us continue. What are we to learn from the story of Jesus remaining behind in the temple when he was 12 years old, while his parents traveled home to Nazareth? I think what we can learn there is that he was truly the son of God, even from birth. Even when he was 12 years old, the kid had it, man. People knew something, but this is not a normal kid here. In a good sense, it was it, it was remarkable, the power of the Holy Spirit on the guy. Okay. Hmm. Does the Bible teach salvation by martyrdom? martyrdom? No, not at all. The Bible does not teach salvation by martyrdom. It does talk about people in Hebrews 11 who believed... Now, the Bible doesn't teach this, but they believed that they would gain a better resurrection from martyrdom. <coughs> but the Bible doesn't say that they were right. The Bible is explaining, you know, they had a fervor for God, which I'm sure the fervor was real. But, you know, martyrdom is not a requ requisition for salvation, and there's nothing in there that says, you know, yeah, that's a better way to go. You know? Christian martyrdom is different from any other martyrdom in the world in that, we have the love of God in us, and um, you know we are so um, we are so convinced that we don't we, we're not part of this world. We don't live for this world. We live for the next one, and the next one is a real world. The next one is a physical world. It's not a Nirvana thing where you become one with some big consciousness and lose your identity, your personality, and everything else, or you come back as a flea. You know, I mean, like the West, you know, has such a uh, a, a ridiculous, like overinflated view of res uh, reincarnation. People that live in in India, you know, teach reincarnation. It's a it's a bondage reincarnation. You go through all these cycles, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and until hopefully you reach some state of nirvana, you know, and and it's it's hopeless, you know, no hope at all. And the Bible says, uh uh, be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord, and 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 it says that we will be changed and we will be like Him. We will have bodies that have superpowers that will live forever and will no longer be tainted by sin and, and, and temptation. And uh, eye hasn't seen, ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. That's 1 Corinthians 2, okay? It's the real deal. Please answer the next four questions. Oh, boy. Please answer the next four questions as if John Council were asking them. Then answer them as if an atheist was the questioner. Okay, I'm supposed to be answering them, and an atheist is asking them. Okay, the atheist says, what am I? Um, well, you're made in the image of God, whether you like it or not. Um, God is infinite. God is uh, incalculable. God uh, knows no beginning, knows no end. And... Uh, even the greatest minds in the world, like Einstein, said that there has to be a mind behind the universe. There's got to be some, you know, like force there that, that keeps this thing going. You're a fool if you don't believe that. He said it in as many words, okay? Uh, Blaise Pascal, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, I'm talking brilliant minds here, said there's a God-shaped vacuum in all of us that only God can fill. So who are you? You're made in the image of God. And the desire of God is that he have, you know, a relationship with his, with his kids. He wants to, he wants to, you know, he describes himself as our father, okay? Not physical, biological father, but that's the kind of relationship he wants with us, okay? So that's what you are. Why am I here? Um, to love God, to uh, um, um, find out what he's like, um, to one day you be united with God and live in harmony and enjoy him forever. Uh, that can't happen, though, until the sin problem is dealt with. Okay? God will not exist with sin. God hates sin. In fact, he hates sin so much. Because remember, he made the rules. Okay? He's God. He's the ultimate. 
And if you don't want to accept that fact, that's, you know, he leaves you the choice to you. Okay, some of us have bought in, some of us believe it, okay? He's made the rules, and uh, um, he uh, hates sin so much that and he could, you know, he could just kind of wink at it and said, okay, that's it. I'm just going to destroy all the evil in the world, make everybody happy, and and everything's going to be hunky-dory now because, uh, you know, I've, I've stepped in and done this wonderful thing, okay? But that, then he'd be violating his own justice. According to his own justice, innocent life has to die to atone for sin. Blood has to be shed, innocent blood. And because that's the way he set up the whole moral side of the universe, and he loves us so much, even in our sin, he would rather take on puny human form and die a whole horrible, torturous death and pay the price for our sin. He'd rather do that than compromise his sin. And of course, that's what he did with Jesus. And he accepted that sacrifice, okay? It was enough. And that's why Jesus rose from the dead, physically. Then you get into talk about the Trinity, and that you know it's difficult for me to handle that. But you know what? I don't expect to understand all the you know the intricacies of God. I'm, I'm a finite person. What is wrong with the world? What is wrong with the world? When an atheist asks that, John Council answer his him. You know they they turn their own way. You know they've made bad choices. They they choose to do their own thing. They choose to think that they're smarter than God. They choose that, you know, I don't need God. So in Romans 1, it says, okay, fine. You know what, me? He turns them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And we haven't even talked about the other spiritual forces that are in the world, okay? And uh, I'm specifically uh, uh, um, talking about the demonic, which, you know, the Bible and God says is very real. And outside of the protection of God, we're sitting ducks for the temptation of the demonic. We're sitting ducks for the destruction of the demonic. And the demonic usually uses, you know, we're quite easy to fool, you know. A few bucks, a few pleasures, you know, the, the, a few, uh, um, you know, and you can get your life ruined forever. Happens all the time. We're so easy to fool. And the last one, how can what is wrong be made right? Only through the blood of Christ. Things have been made right. The devil has lost his authority to deceive. He's lost his authority over men, Okay. Salvation has been made available, but because God loves us, you can't have, a, have somebody love you if they don't choose to love you. So God has done everything he can for man to choose to love him of his own free will. And, and he's laid down his life long before it was ever our idea to, you know, get our lives together. He laid down his life so we could, you know, have a, have a relationship with him. And that's how it works. Just checking, uh, Okay, where are we going next? Next question. I guess those are the four questions, you know, that John Council had to answer the atheist with, so we're done with those. Is there a spiritual difference between male and female? None that I can see. Male and female have different roles. There's certainly, you know, and those roles are complementary, okay, as God intended them to be when, you know, things are right. Um, uh, but as far as a spiritual difference, none. Responsibilities are different. Relationships are different, but, but spiritual, none. There's neither Jew nor, Jew nor uh, Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Okay. What are the effects of feminism on biblical manhood or masculinity in general? Um... The effects are a series of uh, believable lies, okay? Um, although I would suggest that feminism is pretty good at discerning the problem we have in the world with uh, selfish, abusive, and arrogant males. They're pretty accurate. They got it nailed down. You know, the males are abusive. They are accurate, arrogant. They are selfish. But the problem is when they, their solution to it, Feminism's solution to the problem of arrogant, abusive, um, 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 selfish males is to make females selfish, abusive, and arrogant. So we got, you know, your, our, our abusive males, and instead of, you know, feminism comes along and says, oh, we'll fix that. What, you, what happens? You got this happening, you know? When the Bible teaches that, you know, males need to be, you know, protective of women, they need to know their rules, they need to lay down their life for their wives, and wives, they're supposed to submit, and wives are, you know, to, and they're supposed to be like this. You know, that's the biblical ideal there, if we know our roles. 
And, and we, again, it's not one or better than the other. We know our relationship. We know our roles. We know our weaknesses. We know our strengths. And that's the way it's supposed to work, okay? Feminism solutions are dead wrong because, you know, they're not, they're not looking to God. They, they, they bought the lie of the devil that, oh, you know, the, the, the religion is, is, you know, the Bible is nothing but religion. And that puts down women. And, and boy, oh, boy, I mean, there was not a man who ever walked the face of the earth that liberated women more than man, uh, Jesus did. He was always taking hits because, you know, he had Mary Magdalene, the prostitute, that followed him everywhere. He had another prostitute, you know, spend uh, the equivalent of a year's wages just to anoint his body with a fragrant, uh, uh, fragrance from that was broken up in her alabaster jar. Okay? The woman caught in the act of adultery. You know, they throw him at her feet, you know? He that has no sin, cast the first stone. Okay? Women felt comfortable around him because he wasn't like anybody else. You look at, uh, you know, even in the Old Testament, I mean, uh, you know, and there's some churches that are hung up. Well, you can't have women leadership. You can't have women preach. Oh, yeah, explain Deborah to me. Deborah in the book of Judges. She's a female judge. She has more authority than anybody in Israel. She is the closest thing they've got to a king, and she's a lady, okay? Get over your stupid sexist nonsense. Don't bring that into the body of Christ, okay? And don't use the Bible. Don't use the Bible to, you know, to, to, to support your sexism. It doesn't go. When, 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 when Paul says in Galatians, when he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, okay? If that doesn't operate in your church, get out of that church, okay? Why can't we find our need for a relationship with, relationship with Jesus directly stated in Scripture? Who said we can't? Who says you can't find a relationship with Christ directly stated in Scripture? If it wasn't for Scripture, I, I would have no idea how to know God. If it wasn't for Scripture, all I'd have would have a, a bunch of big mouth preachers telling me their opinions on things, okay? In fact, I judge all uh, speakers. I judge everything, you know, uh, um, like that calls itself Christian or authentic by what the Bible says. It's our it's our basis of authority. You know, it's the basis for, you know, every answer I give on this podcast here. Okay. Luke 19, 1 to 10. That's 10 verses. That's a long passage. It's the story of Zacchaeus. Was Zacchaeus converted before Jesus called him down from the tree? Um, I think the process had definitely begun. He was curious. He wanted to find out about this guy that was healing people and preaching this uh, message that made the Pharisees nervous and uh, the common people just adored him. And uh, the rulers of uh, uh, the country at the time, they were really, really nervous and they didn't know what to do with this guy. So I would say that, you know, that something was starting to happen. Spiritual hunger was uh, stirred up. Um, and he climbs a tree because he's short to see Jesus. So this guy's serious about following Jesus. He's got an open heart. I don't think any conversion took place, though, until Jesus went over to his house. I think the steps were there. Just like, you know, anybody that comes to Christ, there's usually a lot of steps involved before somebody says, okay, I'm in, you know? And I think people have a right to do it. I think they should do that. This is... Uh, the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And if it's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, I'm comparing it to uh, the decision that we uh, make about getting married. Nobody would get married just, well, you know, love at first sight. I guess that happens every once in a while. But, you know, chances are, if you don't weigh things, if you don't find out about the, the, your spouse's your future spouse's family, and if you don't spend time together finding out whether you're compatible, you know, that, that marriage is headed for disaster. Marriage is a serious thing. And following Christ is even more important than marriage, okay? So Zacchaeus is checking things out, and his heart was open, you know? Did Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man in order to identify himself with mankind? It seems so, yeah. I think he wanted the message known that he was not, you know, just a God that was, he, he was a man. He was fully man and fully God. And uh, um, that took a little bit of intellectual stretching, especially for the Jews, boy. The Jews had a tough time with that. It's hard pill, pill for them to swallow. That's why Corinthians says, like, to the uh, Gentiles, you know, the Romans and Greeks. So the Romans and Greeks, it's foolishness. And to the Jews, it was a stumbling block. Was, man, you can't get over this. Something's wrong here, you know? 
They had real issues with it, boy. What are the different names of Jesus and what do they mean? Oh, let's see. I I can remember. Well, there's Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, wonderful. That's pretty explicit. We know what that means. Counselor, which is what the role of the Holy Spirit does. But, uh, you know, they're Trinity. Uh, Prince of Peace. Um, Everlasting Father. Again, that shows the Trinity as well. Uh, Messiah, you know, the chosen one, uh, the long-awaited uh, deliverer of Israel, uh, the Lion of Judah, that's another name for Christ, uh, Son of God, Son of Man, uh, God, just plain three-letter word, God, the Lamb of God, which is sacrifice, takes away the sin, uh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, um, how many names is that? Let me count, one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, forty, fifty, sixteen names off the top of my head. That's not bad, boy. I'll tell you, I'm impressing myself. Watch it, John. You're getting cocky. Yeah, you don't want that, boy. Especially on Ask the Pastor, especially if you're, you know, trying to lead people to Jesus. You don't want to get cocky. That's just going to short circuit everything. Humble confidence, folks. Humble confidence. That's 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 our goal. Following Jesus with humble confidence. What is a person saying when they call out to Jesus by name? Um, well, with me, usually it's a, a, a panic call for help. <laughs> you know, Jesus, help, you know. Um, if a person is saying when they call for Jesus by name, um, if they're calling him out and, and they're calling to him, well, they're calling for help. People that are using him in na his name in vain, like if they, you know, hit their thumb with the hammer, trying to hammer a nail in, they, you know, curse and say, you know, that's not calling on his name. That's, in my opinion, that's using his name in vain. That's the misuse of this powerful name of Jesus that the Bible says that there's no other name under heaven or earth that we could be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. So it's pretty powerful. And, so, you know, lots of times, you know, I'm so desperate for God to do, I don't know how to pray, so I just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lately, the last few months, you know, I find myself driving around the car and just saying his name over and over again because I need him. I desire him. I, I, I know I'm, I, he's teaching me how much I need him. John 15, 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I'm not quoting it out of context either. Okay. Pretty explicit. Hmm. When someone lacks evidence of a repentant heart and says, I got Jesus and that's all I need, should we just throw in the towel and give up all hope in their salvation? Well, I don't think you should be engaging in that kind of judgment, you know? You know, how, how do you know that it lacks evidence? That's a hard thing. That's between them and God. That's quite a judgment call to say, well, I don't see any evidence they have a repentant heart. How do you know? You know, you can't always tell a book by its cover. Okay, you never throw in the towel. You give never give hope in somebody's salvation. If somebody says I can't judge, if somebody you know gives their life to Christ, I can't judge the sincerity of that. I gotta trust. Okay, and uh, that that's that's dangerous territory you're walking on, trying to judge somebody's salvation like that. Whoa! Now the, when it says when the scripture says don't judge or you'll be judged, that's what it means right there. In that context, that's exactly what it means. That's what it's talking about. Don't do that. Not good. Not good. Mm -mm. When the thief on the cross spoke to Jesus, would that be considered a prayer? Absolutely. Anytime you're talking to Jesus, that's a prayer. Whether you're right with them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Jesus certainly took it as a prayer because, boy, he answered about as powerfully as you could. He couldn't right his wrongs. He couldn't perform any good deeds. As far as we know, he wasn't baptized. All he could do was verbally defend Jesus. What can we learn regarding our own salvation from the thief that asked Jesus to remember him? Probably the scripture that thunders for me is Acts 2.21. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And the just shall be lived by faith. That's how easy it is. In fact, the thief on the cross is probably the greatest example of Acts 
Whoever calls it the name of the Lord will be saved. And it says, it, there's another, it repeats that line again. That's not just one isolated scripture. I think it's Romans 3, 10 or Romans. I was reading the other day in Romans and it's repeated again. It's the exact same phrase. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. As he's ripping through his Bible here, trying to find it. Let's see. Hmm. Well, I got this one, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Pretty easy. Where's the other one I was looking for? Oh, come on, John. Maybe it was in Romans. Maybe I should have uh, underlined it, you know? Forgot to do that. Well, I screw up too, you know? Oh, yeah, here it is. I got it. Romans 10, 13. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. There it is again. Romans 10, 13. So you got it in two scriptures. Two, two, Acts 2, 21, Romans 10, 13. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a thief on the cross right there. It's legit. When a Christian falls asleep, in other words, when he dies, Kirk makes that clear here. When a Christian falls asleep, where do they wake up? Well, the Bible says like, like Lazarus when they took him to heaven. And, uh, you know, we have no reason to doubt it happens any other way. The angels accompanied Jesus, I believe, when he went up into heaven as well. Or they said there is, you know, there were angels involved. Um, it, you don't wake up anywhere. I think like, uh, I'll use the illustration of my mom. My mom, in fact, I talked to her today. You know, she's got Alzheimer's bad. Okay. She called me twice today in the space of a half hour. And uh, do you ever see dad? Do you ever see dad? I said, no, mom, dad's been dead for 34 years. Oh, I can't remember that. And what about Bill? Well, Bill was her second husband. Well, yeah, he's been gone for 10 years, mom. She's 91. Okay. She got nobody left, all her friends. And, and we pray continually, God take her. Her heart's up in heaven anyway. All her friends are there and everything. And I talk openly with her mom. I said, mom, some night you're going you're gonna to go to sleep and you're going to wake up in heaven. Now, l l according to scripture, she doesn't really wake up in heaven. I guess she wakes up, but, but and I've seen so many people die like this. I've had loved ones die like this, where they fall asleep and they die in their sleep. If you die in your sleep, yeah, you wake up in heaven. But if you get killed in a car accident, you're, you never fell asleep, okay? Now, from what I see in the Bible, the way my mom will go will this. Let's say she goes to bed one night, and let's say she, she dies in her sleep, okay? Um, the angel will come and get her. And they will take her up, and she will know she's being she's leaving her body. She will leave her body, and and the angels will take her up to heaven. Okay, there's an angelic transportation that takes place. Now, if somebody dies without Christ, the angels come and drag them into hell, and you can't fight it because <laughs> the decision's made. And boy, I, I hope you've made that decision. That's why the Bible says now is the accepted time of salvation. Okay, too many people put it off. I remember uh, quoting Stairway to Heaven, you know? There's a line in Stairway to Heaven that says, um, there are two roads you can go by in the long run. There's still time to change the road you're on. Oh, isn't that such a believable lie? Okay, there's two roads you can go down in the long run. There's still time to change the road you're on. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says now is the accepted time of salvation. Okay, do it now. Secure your seat on the glory express to heaven now. You got to have reservations. You don't have reservations. Uh-uh. You ain't going. When a non-believer dies, this is Kirk again, when a non-believer dies, does their soul go directly to hell or to a supernatural prison of sorts until judgment day? They go to an intermediate hell. The Greek word for it is Hades. The Hebrew word is Sheol. And it says in uh, Revelation that death and Hades were thrown into Gehenna. Gehenna is the lake of fire. Gehenna is the eternal hell. Okay? 
And, uh, you know, that's the everlasting hell. But now it is like an intermediate hell. And it's a place of fire. It's a place of torment. It's a place of pain. It's a place of separation. And nobody escapes and nobody gets a second chance. Okay? And the angels, it's, it seems that in the Bible that, that the angels take people there as well. People don't wake up in hell. They get taken there physically. Okay? Spiritually. I mean, it's, it's a physical thing, but it's in a spiritual dimension. What did Jesus say about conversion. What did Peter and Paul say about conversion? Uh, the word conversion is not in the Bible, okay? Um, they both, they all preach the gospel. They all preach the necessity of turning, repenting. Repenting is turning for your direction, changing direction from the way you were going to the direction of pointing to God, okay? Going God's way. So conversion is, you know, it's, that's, a, that's a theological term that, uh, you know, people have added. Not a bad term, it's just not biblical. Is there a spiritual experience at the moment of conversion? Is any such experience necessary? Uh, sometimes there is. I, I would say probably more, most often there is, yeah. I mean, even the psychological aspects of it, if it's deeply understood, it's going to have an effect on you. Um, sometimes there isn't. Um, Without the truth of what the Bible says you must do to be saved, you know, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, okay, that's, those are subjective things, but that's what the Bible says you must do to be saved. Uh, the experience is irrelevant. You know, if you have the experience, great. If you don't, it doesn't take away from the authenticity of what's happened according to Scripture. Okay? It's either bad. It's, I think, uh, you know, to have an experience is a good thing, but... Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't look down on people that didn't have that. You know, I, I, first time I gave my life to Christ, I was seven. I don't remember any experience. I just, I, I should do this, you know, and uh, the various recommittals I had through my teen years, there was no, not much experience there either. I just knew what I had to do. You know, now I've had wonderful experiences in God and, and experienced his grace and his favor and his love. And, you know, but that's, you know, so uh, it, it didn't happen at first with me. So. Maybe my experience is tainted. I don't know. What is the difference between regeneration and conversion? Uh, one's a decision you make. The other is an action that the Holy Spirit engages in. We are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You know? Conversion, giving your life to Christ, that's a decision that you that you take advantage of what's been made available to you, salvation. And you say, yeah, I want that. Okay? It's a decision. It's the product of a decision. And regeneration is done by the Holy Spirit. As you grow in your relationship with the Lord, as you allow God to have his way, the Holy Spirit regenerates you. There are some people that, you know, for whatever reason, there might be misunderstanding or whatever. They, you know, they're, or maybe they're a little more arrogant or a little more stubborn, and it takes a little longer for God to have his way in their life, you know. He has his way, always does, always will. He's won every battle he's ever had with anybody. Is one consciously aware of the exact moment they are regenerated or converted? Oh, I don't know. Uh, it, it's not crucial to salvation if you're aware or not. And regeneration is something that is, is ongoing. It's continual. When uh, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not an instantaneous thing. The original Greek means continually be filled. Okay, be refilled and filled and filled and filled. Okay, why? Because we leak. We spiritually leak. And the water, the living water, it you know it it it'll gets it, it doesn't get stagnant because it, it needs refilling. That's why we gather for church. That's why we read the Word. That's why we stay fresh. That's what the Bible means. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, you work at it. Don't let laziness rob you of what is rightfully yours of God. That's Hebrews six twelve. Is there a difference between surrender and submission? I can't see much. Can't see much difference between surrender and submission uh, when it comes to a biblical context, you know, of living your life to please God, living your life in the Lordship of Christ, following him. Yeah, I don't see a difference between surrender and submission. Same thing. Was human DNA designed? Absolutely absolutely there's no way that something as accurate as biological dna in even the simplest one-celled organism 
The DNA codes and structures of even the most simple one cell organi organism is so complicated that there's no way in heaven or hell that ever happens by accident. In fact, that is, I mean, you want to see that the only people that believe in evolution are people that do not understand the intricacies of DNA and how in the heck did it get that way? Because there's no way that non-biological matter comes together and you you know run a lightning bolt through it or all the other magical crazy things that you know the evolutionists believe and all of a sudden you've got the building blocks of life that evolve and get even more complicated over billions of years that is beyond impossible impossible and it is the dumbest interpretation of the biological historical record we've got it's just nonsense i mean just come on they, you know they never say this in schools but this is what evolution is okay nothing times nothing times blind chance plus billions and billions of years equals everything are you kidding me you got more faith than me to believe in that nonsense. That's crazy. You know, they think they're so smug and they're so Oh, yeah, you Christians believe in a talking snake. Yeah, well, you believe that you get everything from nothing. Show me where that's demonstrated in the laboratory. Well, it's been proven by science. No, it hasn't. It's never been proven by science. You bought into their stupid lies because you don't have a mind. Leviticus 21.10 says the high priest must not tear his clothes. But in Mark 14, 63, after Jesus answers a question, the high priest becomes so upset he tore his clothes. And that's not the only time. There's lots of times when it happens. How are the Jewish leadership punished when they broke the law? Well, they, that, it was never enforced. Because tearing your clothes was it, was, it was a sign of extreme emotion. and You were almost inviting the curses of God on you. You were doing something that was sinful. You were doing something you wasn't supposed to do. You know, you were so upset over it, okay? And I don't remember anywhere in Scripture, I know it's the law, that anybody gets in trouble or is condemned by God because they're tore their clothes. It's almost as if God says, yeah, you need to tear your clothes over this. You need to freak out, okay? Tearing your clothes is, is the biblical uh, uh, equivalent of freaking out. Someone says Caiaphas tore his clothes. That's that's the same as uh, that's same as uh, the the biblical writer saying Caiaphas freaked the hell out. Okay, he was never condemned. So I guess you know that's a great question. Never had that one, Kirk. Ah, you're a genius, buddy. Love working with you. One more question: Why are Muslims so hung up on Jesus' claims that he was the Son of God? They insist Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. But why? Mark 14, 62 is only one of many times where he did claim his sonship. And this was in front of the Sanhedrin. Okay? And the high priest. He claims his sonship. Okay. Um, they're hung up on it because, uh, uh, you know, that's their problem, not mine. You know, like, they're hung up on it because they're, they worship a false god. Okay? Book of John, oh my goodness, the book of John has more references to Jesus claiming divinity and being the Son of God than anywhere else in the Bible. Full of it. Just full of claims. And, uh, you know, that goes against their religion because, like, uh, there's, a, there's a scripture that says the person who says that Jesus has not, that the, Jesus has not come in the flesh, okay, that God has not come in the flesh, that person is the Antichrist. Now, it doesn't specifically mean the Antichrist, the person, but that's the spirit of Antichrist. That's a test. For the authenticity of any religious belief. Has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? No, no, that's he's not God. Okay, well, that's, I mean, it goes down to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, uh, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then um, 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 your faith is futile and our preaching is useless. Good way to end the, end the show. Ready to pray? Let's pray. Father, everything we've shared tonight, Lord, the, uh, the studying of your scripture, the, ex the expounding of it, the explaining of it. God, I pray that, Lord, if I was right and if I was accurate, all that stuff that was true, God, I pray it would multiply in our lives. 
I pray the stuff that was accurate and right and, and honored you tonight, Lord, would stick to us like glue. Now, God, the stuff where maybe I was wrong and just maybe John Council's personality or kind of left field, Lord, that, that, Lord, you can let that run off our backs like a, like water off a duck's back, God. That doesn't have to stick. But God, your word is true. And Lord, we know enough of it, God, that its power is made great, Lord, will be communicated. And I pray, Lord, it would not return to you empty, that it will have its impact in everybody who listens, Lord, who's listened live tonight, and God, people who are going to be tuning in during the week, Lord. Let it be just as rich a blessing to them as well. And Lord, keep us all following you and help us to know what you're really like. Not like that dead God of religion, Lord God, but that wonderful, exciting God, Lord God, that that, that, that fills our steps and our lives with joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Have a great night. Thanks for tuning in. We're back at it live next week, 9 o'clock. Same bat time, same bat time. Christ Church Ottawa Facebook page. Love y'all. Night.